how would you, you help you with that design? How would you help with that design? You first, first, first. How would you help with that design? Well, it's a good question. I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. So like, let's say I'm looking at, um, uh, I, I don't know, two, two species of monkey. And one species of monkey has uh, very large canines, uh, and one species of monkey has very small canines. And I'm thinking to myself, okay, well, based off of where they're positioned in the fossil record, our small canine monkey is, is the ancestor, which is the oldest monkey we have in this example. Um, so how do I know that it's the ancestor of big canine monkey? Well, if I look in the geologic area, that same location that I'm finding these fossils, and through geologic time, I find monkeys, more monkey fossils, proceedingly larger canines, then I can safely say, well, we're seeing morphologic change over geologic time. And within the fossil record, that's kind of the extent of what we can say with regard to, okay, is this a transitional or is it not? Genetics is what corroborates that and tells us, okay, well, are the changes that we think we're seeing in the fossil record actually happening? Are we really seeing what we think we're seeing? Um, and is there enough time to do it? And the answer to both of those is indeed yes. So with, with human evolution, we start 13-ish million years ago in, in the Miocene. Um, and what we're essentially looking at is an organism that is probably, if not, say, Helanthropus chidensis, very similar to, say, Helanthropus chidensis. This is like a chimpanzee-style animal, um, but it's foramen magnum. The, the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord pops out is much more underneath the skull than it would be for, like, a chimpanzee. Um, and you can think just mechanically. If your foramen magnum, the, again, the hole at the base of your skull, I can actually show you because I have all these skulls back here. Yay! Um, this right here. So this hole right here. If this hole is further back on the skull, then in your natural position, you're probably going to be jetting your head out forward like an animal that walks on all fours. You could use that canine skull. The more skull. ventral it moves, the more likely it is that you're holding your head up on top of your, your vertebral column like that. Uh, and the more likely it is, speaking, your bipedal animal. Which is why Sahelanthropus is such a good candidate for the, the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees, uh, because it, it occupies that intermediate space between the two of us. Erica, it also has slightly... Oh, go ahead, please. Can we see the, the foramen magnum on, like, say that um, there's another monkey up there, or maybe the canine, if that's easier to, to grab? No, this is perfect. So if you see this, this is a rhesus macaque. This is a, a, a model, a resin model, I think it's resin, of a rhesus macaque. So these are old world monkeys. And if you look at where the foramen magnum is on the rhesus macaque, not only is it on the back of the skull, but it's angled this way. And if you compare that to the human skull, right, the foramen magnum is not only tucked underneath, but it's angled forwards, if, if you can't see that. There you go. Right. Um, so, and, and that's because a rhesus macaque, while it can walk on two feet, this animal is, this animal definitively has its head, like its vertebral column is coming out like this, right? Because rhesus macaques walk on all fours. They're, they're monkeys. They're, they just, they're ground monkeys. They do ground monkey things. Um, they're also very mean, <laughs> but I like them. I like them anyways. Um, so yeah, so, so say Helanthropus chidensis is going to be the individual uh, that we look to when we're like, all right, this is the oldest animal that we see that is a primate that is starting to show human, quote unquote, characteristics. Um, are, are, are you with me up until that point? Conceptually Absolutely. speaking. Absolutely. Right. Okay, sweet. So now we have to consider, and, and this is what, you know, generally what I like to do when I'm thinking about the hominins, is I like to say, okay, first of all, what suite of characteristics separate humans, us, from this common ancestor of, of us and chimpanzees, say Helanthropus chidensis. You can pretty safely do this with a chimpanzee as well, just because say Helanthropus has more in common with a chimpanzee, just in gross morphologic features, than it does with us. So what makes this different? Okay, well, we're bipedal, right? We walk on two legs, and we have a lot of physical traits that lend themselves to that bipedality. The shape of our pelvis is like a bowl, so that it can hold all our organs in when we walk upright. 
Um, we have a need that's valgus in nature, so it's a, a specific angle so that it can carry our weight directly underneath us rather than spread out among all four limbs um, for walking on, on four legs. We have an inline big toe and a, a, a specific rigidity to our midfoot so that we can push off with our toes when we walk, um, as well as like um, essentially hold our foot together in, in a single line, um, which allows us to like walk more efficiently. We have a very small thorax, like our, our kind of rib cage and pelvis is much smaller in comparison to our legs, and our legs are longer than our arms. So all of those characteristics, along with that ventral foramen and magnum coming out of the, the base of the skull, lend themselves to bipedality. So what we can do is we can say, okay, well, all of those gross morphologic traits exist in humans and they don't exist in chimps. So what we should see if human evolution is true is we should see a ratio of those basal traits becoming these more derived traits through geologic time. That's like a, a prediction that we can generally make. Which um, was made. Yeah, which was made, right, exactly. And initially, if, if memory serves, our first, uh, one of our first hominin fossils that we found was like, it was essentially Homo erectus. And with Homo erectus, we were like, okay, this is still pretty human. But for instance, another another trait that is shared specifically by humans and, and no other primates is we have, and including with the hominins, is a chin. So we have this little jetting outwards of the bone at the very base of the mandible. So for instance, Homo erectus lacked a chin. It also had a massive brow ridge. So this, this resin model of the human skull, while we have a brow ridge, it's so diminutive in comparison to what we see in some of our, our big boy hominins. Um, but yeah, so, so those are a couple of the traits. It's in addition, uh, what I study for my master's degree is actually um, canine teeth. So I'm looking at the, the re-emergence of monomorphism in primates. That is to say, males and females have the same size canine teeth, which is, of course, true in humans. It's true in many primates, but not likely true in some of the Miocene apes that we have. So we can look, too, to the canine teeth of a general human and say, okay, these canine teeth are kind of wimpy, right? Like, we have them, but they're wimpy. I mean, this animal is much smaller, <laughs> and the rhesus macaque's canine teeth are much more than those of a human. So the reason for that a lot of times has to do with the social structure, but we can just use it as a gross morphologic characteristic to separate us from chimps and us from say Helanthus chidensis as well. So that's another characteristic that we should see. We should see the canine teeth shrinking through the fossil record if human evolution is indeed factual. The same goes for everything that, that falls in line with having smaller canine teeth, which one of those is actually a change in the shape of the palate. So the shape of this human palate right here, if you can't see, is really parabolic. It looks like a, like a, a smooth hill. And in chimpanzees and in many of our, of our hominins, what we see is a rectangle. We see, we see a big fat rectangle that's kind of sharp on the corners. And actually I can just show you on this rhesus macaque again. Why do I keep putting it up? So this is a, a very big rectangle, right? It's, it's long. And part of the reason for that is to allow the canine teeth to hone against each other, right? So that it can keep them really sharp for, for competing with one another and potentially scaring off predators. And of course, the last big thing that I like to point to in human evolution is the brain case size. So humans have these big globular brain cases that are just gigantic. Um, we have small faces to, accom to uh, uh, accommodate this giant brain case. Our prognathism is heavily reduced. Um, we've got much flatter faces, much smaller muzzles than the rest of the than the rest of the primates. Um, the brow ridge is obviously disappearing, and and we we just kind of made room forcibly for this giant brain case. And this is continuing to be seen in modern humans as we lose our our wisdom teeth. Um, in in many people, like for instance, I had I'm I guess I'm very basal and not very evolved because I have all I had all four of my wisdom teeth taken out. But some people are born with no wisdom teeth but just to suggest that they're they're essentially making room in the jaws this is a holdover trait this reduction in in teeth size from making room for that big skull so those are like generally speaking the the whole suite of characteristics that we should see change from more basal to more derived in the fossil record so now i think it would be fun to look at the fossils and see if that's what we see what do you think
Well, I would, yeah, I would like to make sure that, uh, Kane, what are your thoughts so far on this? Because um, I think it, it, to sum that argument up, it's like, hey, evolution is, at least in terms of fossils, this morphological change over geological time. We have what we think would be at least representative of the anatomy of the common ancestor of humans and chimpanzees. We know what changes we would expect. We find such changes. Prediction confirmed. In terms of science, that's, that's a pretty big win in terms of the, the viability of the idea of common ancestry between humans and chimpanzees. So what is your thought on that? Right. So my personal... Uh, thought is that like the difference between I believe it's a Helianthropus mm. and Pithecus and Australopithecus and humans. If you looked at all of those and chimps included, you would see a gradient. And that's not uh, my argument. My personal beef is with the transitions from Australopithecus to Homo. Ah, yes. This this would be your your um, Australopithecus sediba and Homo habilis, or habilis, depending on um, if you're pronouncing it right or if you're me. Who is more right? Um, but yes, I I so I have a video that I have a couple of videos that go over the exact nature of uh, Australopithecus sediba as well as Homo habilis. But I have some very handy pictures just right offhand as well that, that we can zip through um, to see whether or not um, these guys occupy that, that essential midpoint, right? Um, there is a paper by, oh my gosh, I think it's, I think it's Lee Berger, because he, he is the, the um, discoverer of Australopithecus sediba. Because Sediba and Habilis basically occupy those two linchpins that connect genus Homo to the Australopithecines. Um, and the, the main difference between the two of those individuals has to do with cranial morphology. Now, there's a little bit going on, too, in the postcrania, but it's generally agreed upon by paleontologists, period, that, that you're Australopithecines were bipedal. So Lucy, she was walking around on two legs at least habitually, like, and by habitually, I mean, not obligately, like she, she could have gotten around um, on all fours in the trees and things like that, but probably not so much on the ground, just just looking at the habitat that they occupied, in addition to uh, their, their gross morphology. But I, I see where you're coming from because it's very easy to look at these species and be like, okay, well, you've got Lucy, right? And she's she's essentially got some traits that that do look kind of human, right? But by and large, she's she's still fairly apish, you know, quote unquote. She's got this big prognathic snout. Um, she's losing those big canines, and and the males of that species are too. Uh, if if the other couple dozen <laughs> really good Australopithecus afarensis specimens that we have or anything to go off of. But I get where you're coming from because it, it's got to do with with sewing those two together, genus homo and the Australopithecines. Can we do that? And I would love to, if it's okay with you, look at some of the fossils that we have for that. Would that be chill? Yeah, um, I, I would like to make a, two clarifications too. Yes, please. As far as Australopithecus being bipedal and the foramen magnum of the Australopithecus uh, genre, mm. Paranthropus or any of those, I fully accept that they were bipedal mm. and and all of that. They uh, the actual fossils are what they are. Mm. It's just personal opinion of their analysis might be a little bit flawed, and I personally feel that the Australopithecus uh, type kind of extends into Homo erectus, and in that inside of the genus Homo erectus, that there's human specimens and also Australopithecine. Okay, I, also. I have a question. I would like, uh, I, Ken, I would like for you to, to clarify what you mean when you say the analysis might be flawed, um, because it's it's a little bit vague, and I. I think it'll be hard to address that unless I have a 
or at least unless Erica has a really good idea of what you mean by the analysis might be flawed. Do you think that um, these animals maybe should be put in different uh, genera because you don't think they actually are close enough, say, to humans in terms of morphology? Do you think that the anatomy has been incorrectly reconstructed? Uh, do you think that some of the specimens may actually be chimeric in nature? What, what specifically do you think is the error in analysis that the paleontologists have been making? Um, like, particularly when there's just a skull to go off of. Okay. Or mostly the idea is not that they've jumbled a bunch of bones together. <laughs> well, that's good because we, we had yeah. heard that argument before that. Yes, we have. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah. It's, it's good that you're not going there because. <laughs> um, so, 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 so really <clears throat> quickly, I think. I think I get a bit what Kane is saying. So I want to clarify, very frequently you get individuals who um, who look at the lineup of the skulls and they're like, yes, I see those skulls and I recognize that, you know, that there, there does appear to be a gradient, um, but that doesn't mean that you can't necessarily draw a line somewhere. And usually that line is drawn between the Australopithecines and the beginning of genus Homo. Um, now, Homo erectus does exhibit an insane amount of variety. But that being said, looking at Homo erectus and potentially saying, well, maybe some members are more Australopithecine in nature, I think that's a difficult thing to do because Homo erectus is more derived than Homo habilis, Homo gautengensis, and Homo rudolfensis. So to look at some members of Homo erectus and to say, Yes, I think some may be Australopithecine would be to also relegate those past three individuals to the Australopithecine genera. Um, and if the if the um, the fossils and the geology's timing is anything to go off as well, that would probably also push Homo floresiensis, uh, the, the hobbit, into the Australopithecines as well. No, I, um, I have a quick question. Um, it's Basically, this is me trying to say, hey, am I right about this? Because it's my understanding that the the distinction where we draw the line between genus Australopithecus and genus Homo is fundamentally arbitrary. Yes. Basically, someone just said, here's the cutoff. We just have to have something, and this is where it is. And it's is yep. it mostly it, cranial size or brain case size. That's that's what I was going to say. It, it's mostly crania and like it's mostly brain case and some very minute craniofacial features. Um, you can kind of point to some general trends too that we see in the postcrania that that are indeed looking to be more uh, consistent. It's, it's a mammal postcranium. No one cares. Erica. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly. <laughs> what I, mean. So, I mean, we we've got some we've got some nice like, coral girdle stuff going on, but then then Naledi came into the picture, and Naledi was like, "Now nah, we're just going with a really basal. <laughs> we're just having like a a very clearly." like organisms spending some time in the, in the trees with these weirdly arboreal forelimbs. Um, but yeah, so I think too, uh, Kane, it's very important to note that with a lot of these fossil finds from, from the, from the position of someone who's not, I guess, uh, super invested in the idea of, oh, wow. Okay. We found a new hominin. Let's learn everything we can about it. Um, it's important to dig into those finds and look at the in situ pictures, um, meaning like the pictures before they chisel them out of the ground, because it gives you a really good idea on how close together the remains were. Um, very frequently, I think the, the general public gets this idea that it's like, okay, well, we found a mandible right over here, and then 800 you know, meters away, we found like a clavicle. And we put those two together and we're like, ah, this is <laughs> Australopithecus afarensis. Um, and this is the single individual. And uh, great. You know, the, the print the check, send them home. Um, but, it, but it's not nearly as simple as that. Fragmentary remains are usually not considered to be, like they're not assigned to a single individual. Um, and when, an, when a whole skeleton is presented, typically... It's because they're found like literally within a meter or two of one another. Um, or alternatively, very rarely this happens, but it does happen sometimes. You might find something that's relatively far away, but it'll be like a scapula piece 
and you can you can fit them together like the, the piece upriver and the piece downriver of, of the scapula and in that case i mean the, st the statistical odds of not being able to do that right um would would be pretty strong if we were dealing with something that that wasn't a, a, a single individual with a perfect break down the scapula yeah chances are um, two different scapulae didn't break exactly the same way right precisely right and so so i think that there's a lot more to it than people generally give paleontologists credit for when we're looking at these specimens it, it's they, they don't really eyeball them like with uh with, with standing in the rest of the brain trust they're young earth creationists but uh these guys that we deal with on youtube sometimes here came they it seems have this idea that we'll look at a we'll look at a fossil remain right a skull or a mandible or a tooth or whatever and we'll say eh, this kind of looks like it could be a triceratops horn yeah, well, yeah, I mean, really, yeah, this looks, uh, it's the same general thing, except it's, what, 44 centimeters long, or inches, or whatever, I can't even remember what that By one. the way, I absolutely um, adore that shirt, I just wanted to say that. Oh, my Michael Scott paper company, yes, I know. Yes, that was amazing. I, yeah, I really, I, we like to support Michael in this house, we're, we're Michael supporters, even though he's a very flawed boss, I, I'm highly sympathetic to him, I wanted them to do well, um, but yeah, so, so, the crux of what I'm saying, though, Kane, is, like, there's so much measuring that goes on when you find the remains of an organism. So like you'll take the, the tooth, like the individual tooth of what I do with my skull. Here it is. You'll take like the tooth and you'll look at the cusping of the tooth. So like the how how each molar comes to an apex in each individual cusp or the length of the canine in its um, height, in its breadth. And so like your your height, canine height bugal lingual, which is the sideways length, and it's and it's um, mesiodistal, which is the front to the back. And all of these measurements of every little bit of each remain will be taken and contrasted to the other data that we have. Now, this can become difficult for one particular reason, and that's life history, because primates are really weird in that our craniofacial features change a lot from when we're babies to when we're adults. Um, this is for this reason, when you look at a, a, a baby chimpanzee's skull, it looks really human. Um, and that's because a lot of their androgens that, that come at play when they're aging is what gives them that big prognathic face. So the key to that, though, again, falls to the teeth because the teeth are the sure and the sutures of the skull. Um, but both of those ways are great, easy methods for, for coming up with a, a, a general range of age for this organism. And typically that'll be like, okay, it's still growing or no, it's no longer growing. And if it's no longer growing, then you can compare it to the other adults that you have. And if it still is, then you can look at it in comparison to the other juveniles that you have. Because we have a lot of juveniles. It turns out baby baby hominins are not very good at not getting killed. Um, we have like a I mean, lot of- Look at babies. Young... They, they, yeah, they like to eat babies. and then just vomit it up anyway. Like, come on. Oh no, I know. I mean, like the the, the from the Tong child to the Dakika child to you know, um, baby humans uh, just tr are trying to get killed. Uh, yeah, and they're getting eaten by everything on the savanna. So yep. you know, it's it's, well, actually, it's a difficult. There, there's actually a video game about that, where, where uh, it's a it's a multiplayer game, and one person plays as the dad, who's trying to make sure that the player who's playing as the baby doesn't get killed. And the player is the baby wins if they kill the baby and they can do stuff like get into the kitchen sink, get like the, the cabin under the kitchen sink and drink bleach or like, you know, crash through a glass table and stuff. And it's like, yeah, it's, it's because babies are really bad at staying alive. They they really are. And we see this in like natural selection where it's like their 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 brains are so spongy because they're falling all the time. Like if a human adult fell as often as a baby did, you'd have brain damage. The babies are just all over the place. Um crashing into things and you know, they're a mess i i that's why i'm nervous to be around babies because i'm like this little thing is going to get itself hurt and i'm not going to be able to stop it <laughs> um, well i think right now i really want to drill into kane what specifically you find as objectionable because right now you said maybe there's been some misinterpretation in the fossils um and i i want to know specifically what may have been misinterpreted? What do you think, uh, say, maybe a better interpretation might be for some specific, uh, at least species, uh, or, or maybe genera, if you want to go a little bit broader there? And also, what do you think is the problem for, say, the transition between the genera of uh, Australopithecus and Homo? Because it seems like 
what I've heard from you previously as well as today is that you feel like that is a that is you know a bridge too far for Australopithecus um, into Homo. Right. So my my personal view, and I I hope I'll be able to hear my illustration this time, but uh, the the idea that I feel is happening is they're misinterpreting uh, certain types of evolution. Which I'm types of evolution? Very similar, uh, like for example, now I, I accept Neanderthals is very human. So the difference between Neanderthals and us is like the uh, tibia and fibula are longer in us, the Homo sapiens. Mm -hmm. And uh, there's a things, and we've our skulls have obviously changed. And I feel that things like that that would happen within a uh, a population could have happened in two populations and because one is going through that at this time and another has the other uh, characteristics that they kind of get blended together as a transition. So I, I want to express something that the, um, well I think that older Earth creations are obviously um, significantly uh, more advanced in terms of ability to assess science and things than young Earth creationists. One of the things that frustrates me about a lot of uh, old Earth creationism is that it's very hard to figure out what their actual stance is, and that's what I'm having here. I'm not sure what the argument is, because I feel like I hear you saying that you believe that Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis have common ancestry, and I mean, I would agree, they do. They are very similar species, all things considered, although they are adapted to different environments, so that explains some of the morphological differences, like the kind of stockier limbs on Neanderthalensis, the the uh, sort of triangular shaped rib cage, the the um, you know the deep, they've got a very deep um, sinus too. Yeah, yeah, to help warm air as it's going in, stuff like that. Um, but I don't see why saying. Homo sapiens and Homo neanderthalensis would share common ancestry is an objection to the general trend of human evolution from more basal uh, primates like, you know, Sahelanthropus and, uh, you know, our common ancestor with, uh, you know, chimpanzees or even gorillas or orangutans or gibbons or going all the way back. Finding two similar, more modern species of Homo, I, I don't see why that's a problem, and that's the only point that I've really heard that I can May, may sink I, my I add teeth a, into. a joint question onto that, Dapper? Um, so what I'm hearing as well is that of, of all of our hominins, the ones that you are cool with um, sharing a common ancestor in genus Homo would be humans, anatomically modern Homo sapiens, and Homo neanderthalensis what Dapper said. Would I be correct then to say that in your opinion, like the likes of Heidelbergensis and Erectus and um, uh, Naledi, these guys would not be considered to be human, at least a common ancestor of humans in your opinion? So uh, in my opinion, we share ancestry with uh, some specimens of Homo erectus mm -hmm. and anything after that pretty much. Right. Except for Letty and uh, actually I think that's it. So you you, you say the Naledi is not does not share common ancestry with Homo sapiens. Mm. And now th this that's is right. this is interesting to me because you say um, some specimens of Homo erectus you do not think share common ancestry with modern Homo sapiens. So it's your position, if I'm hearing it correctly, that Homo erectus is actually a, it's actually more than one species. Some individuals that have been identified right. as Homo erectus are improperly so identified. Right. 
Okay. Do you have any specific fines or pictures of fines or um, like examples of of uh, criteria in a in a given specimen or whatever? Yeah, maybe you... some specimen catalog number that could work too. Yeah, what whatever, just like an example um, of this one sh was classified as homo as homo erectus, but it should have been an australopithecine. Like the Demancy, Georgia uh, fossil finds. I the haven't Demancy, find Georgia. one that is uh, human. But uh, so you you would say that one was did share common ancestry with Homo sapiens. No, I think he's saying that that would not be. Okay, I wasn't super clear. What, Kane, is it the the Demancy does share or does not share common ancestry? Does not share common ancestry with Homo sapiens. Okay, we are. Erica is currently busily getting images of that up, ready. Um, I would like to know though, on what basis you make that determination. Well, uh, it's my analysis, which to share, I'm going to have to switch to my tablet. Okay. And I'm not sure if it gives some uh, feedback. So. All right. So here is, um, and this is probably where I'll cut back in with the edit. While Erica is scratching her armpit like a little chimpanzee. I'm sorry, I had an itch. <laughs> All right. So uh, you guys should be able to see this skull. We have a uh, bit of a grid here. And um, is this the one that you wanted uh, me to show? Yes. Okay. So what have we here? Okay. This should be a Homo erectus individual. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, the grid is placed uh, where there's a line at the foramen magnum, mm -hmm. at the bottom of the maxillary, mm -hmm. and at the top and bottom of the eye sockets. Mm -hmm. Um. Do you have more layers that you can see, Dapper? I'm sorry, say that again? There should be more layers to the image. Alright, so what layer so would you like to make active or whatever? I can do whatever bottom. you need. So, Go from the bottom up. <laughs> okay, so yeah, layer two. Alright. So would you like okay, me to so add? The very next goal should be the Australopithecus uh, Littlefoot specimen. So, basically the idea is to line up those same features across uh, any specimen. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I've come to see is that they all fall under either the Australopithecus or the human category based off this. And by human... And sorry, I just, wanted what, I just want your definition for what human counts as because not everyone has the same definition there. The physical characteristics what do you mean by that so here's here's my concern um i i like the idea that you're taking a look at fossils trying to get them to be scaled reasonably well to each other so that you can compare the relative sizes of various morphological parts and bits i like that right that's a good stuff right there what concerns me, however, is that you are trying to classify organisms without having an articulate some a definition you can articulate for at least one of the groups that you want to assign them to. So you have you said Australopithecus versus human, but when I ask you to define one of those things, you do not have a clear anatomical definition for it, and that concerns me because then it means any classification that you make is going to be fundamentally arbitrary. And that may, raises the question of why is it important that you have made this determination? Because I can't tell you whether or not it means anything because you can't either. You see what I mean? So I think, so I think, I think what um, I think what he is going for, Dapper, and correct me if I'm wrong, Kane. What I'm getting is that you're essentially saying, okay, two very big differences between. Our, our later genus Homo and our earlier hominins would be the location of the foramen magnum and the brain case size. Therefore, um, if I can plot them and I can get two distinct groups, that's where I can draw the line. Is that... If, if two distinct groups um, becomes evident, yes. Right, okay. So 
quickly, um, one thing to note with that, and again, I, I want to go through all of the uh, all of the skulls that you've got pulled up there that Dapper has. Um, do you by chance, first, first very quickly, is bipedality emerged very early. So it's unlikely that you're going to get, I don't know anything about the plotting or, or what it is that you did indeed get, but it's unlikely that you're going to get anything super consistent grouping wise with regard to the location of the foramen magnum just because we see bipedality so early in the fossil record with regard to the hominins. Brain case size, you're absolutely going to see clustering, but it depends on the specimens you use. Because one thing that is very, so they're, they're very similar to paleontology with general animals. There is public paleontology, which is like, okay, here's our press release. And then there is non-consensus paleontology, which is like, what is everyone arguing about? Um, an example of this with dinosaurs would be, okay, well, did T-Rex have lips, right? Like, usually when you see... No, when maybe. Yeah, who knows? But when it's portrayed in in media, typically, you know, T-Rex has these big honking teeth sticking out all over the mouth, and it's very menacing and spooky. Um, but that really is something that's up for debate in paleontology. No one really knows for sure. Um, I lean now, towards in, yes, by the way. Ooh, interesting. Yeah. I, I, I want to pick your brain as to why at some point. Okay. Um, in the hominins, though, that big question is, where does speciation occur? Where can we draw lines? And where, where does a speciation event end and variation within a species begin? Um, which is why if you've got, like, generally speaking, it would be bad practice, in my opinion, to take, and I don't know, maybe you've accounted for this in, <clears throat> in, your, in your kind of experiment here. There are so many different kinds of homo erectus in part because no one knows where to draw the line and say, okay, either it's one hypervariable species of hominin, or instead of homo erectus, we've also got homo ergaster and homo georgicus and homo erectus, but middle uh, and late as well, or beginning early, middle, and late as well. So you've got this potential for high variability within a species, or alternatively, multiple species that do indeed overlap. Um, so my question would be, and to, to put it quite simply, are you representing Homo erectus and in also Homo habilis, which the problem would be, is it Homo habilis, or is it Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo gantengensis? Do you have those represented or are you going with a single skull for each species? And if so, which skull did you use for those, for Homo habilis and for Homo uh, erectus? Um, well, it's it's a number of skulls for each species. Mm. Primarily okay. the- uh, That's awesome. I mean, I'm not 100% certain of what I've gotten. No, I know, they, they can be confusing. You, you primarily use the transition. Mm-hmm. It's a very impressive image, but I uh, it seems to fall under the data clustering concept. Okay, so the the question I would have is, um, do you feel like in order for this transition to be valid, we would need there to be something between the clusters, or we need them to cluster together, or to form a line when you plot the data? Like, what is it that you so? A hypothesis is yeah, Australopithecus is ancestral to genus Homo. What is your prediction, Kane Wilson, as to what we should see in the fossils to to say that that's probably the case? And then the null hypothesis is they're not related, so this is what we should see. What is your prediction for both of those? Well, my prediction is that there should be a uh, definite difference between genus Homo and Australopithecus and that like uh, certain characteristics like like how big the jaw is for instance might change or the ear placement mm -hmm. it those two things kind of go together there's certain changes but overall there will be a definite sighting as to whether it's human or not, not okay and this is your this is your prediction this is your prediction for Australopithecus is not ancestral to genus Homo. Right. Okay, what is your prediction for Australopithecus is ancestral to genus Homo? Well, I'd like to see the, uh, 
the brain case get like pretty much intermediate in between the two places and also the um, the positioning of the eyes and the prognathism to mm. become more obvious than what I see with this graph. Okay. So so one thing too that I want to note just in in listening as you mentioned earlier it's it's very very key when we're assessing the position of various hominins to consider the postcrania as well um because very frequently what classifies an organism as being mosaic may be a series of traits now now this is this is not does not hold true always but a series of traits that may be very basal in the skull, whereas the postcrania may be very derived. Now, typically, I don't actually know of a species that has an entirely basal crania with an entirely derived or even just mostly derived postcrania. Usually in the crania, we also see basal and derived traits mixed in with one another. Um, a- an additional problem you have with that is like, so with the positioning of the eyes, from what I've seen, the the eye positioning, that is to say the shape of the orbits and where they are with regard to the rest of the face, is super plastic, even within your derived populations of like Neanderthals. So you might have Neanderthals with huge honking brow ridges, even though that's something that wasn't very nearly as prevalent in, you know, Homo habilis, um, that has then re-emerged to be something prominent in the Neanderthals. Um, as you know, this is this is something that, or I, I'm saying, I'm assuming that you know, maybe you don't. If you don't, totally fine. But typically, a lot of like a lot of physical traits that are open for selection, right? They tend to be pretty plastic and and can re-emerge like within a decently small amount of time, um, which is why we see sometimes in human populations even today more derived, quote unquote and more basal, quote-unquote, traits appearing and disappearing, uh, like with the wisdom teeth or the brow ridge or even the chin. There, there are populations, very small populations of individuals living, coincidentally, near the island of Flores that have reduction in the chin, in the, in the bony protuberance that is the chin. Um, basically, my point is I don't think that you can use safely the location of the orbits and the shape of the, the zygomatics and the brow ridge to... Uh, determine your positioning just because that's going to be something that's going to change around relatively quickly. I right. think your use of the crania is excellent. I, or crania, I'm sorry, brain case is excellent. I think that's a great, that's that's used by many anthropologists to draw the line. Um, and the Ferumen Magnum too, because bipedality is such an important thing. Like I said, I think you're going to have problems clustering. I'd be, I, let me just ask, actually, do you see clustering? Have you in your individual experiment seen clustering with the foramen magnum? And if so, where? And does it match up with the brain case? That's a question, too. I'm sorry. Uh, did you ask that again in a different way? Yes, absolutely. Okay, so um, the, the two main traits that you've assessed, or two of the main traits that you have assessed in your experiment are the size of the brain case and the location of the foramen magnum. Yes? Yes. Uh, Okay. Do they? Do you draw the line when you say because you say you've got these two distinct clusters? Do the foramen magnum clusters match the brain case clusters? As far as I can tell. Okay, and uh, where is that line? I'm sorry. What? Um, which which hominin is the last hominin in group A to group B? There's. A lovely mix in between Homo erectus that's some are on that side and some are on this side. Okay. So let me ask you, do you have like, and again, I would love if you by chance have the the labels for each of the skulls handy. I would love to see what you've got for uh, Habilis, Rudolfensis, and Naledi as well as your basal Homo erectus. Do you, by chance, have those handy? Um, I don't exactly have the uh, labels, as it was just a very basic analysis here. Right, yeah, right. I'm with you. But uh, I can try to remember which one is which, and there's also the lineup that that you have 
it's not much more than than the picture that you had uh, that you usually use, but it's right. Still, um, so basic. My idea was to give maybe not specifically solely the one trait or the other, but generally the foramen magnum has to be in the same spot. Mm -hmm. And then scale it to where this falls into this same spot so that they're comparable on a relative level. Now, okay, maybe this is this is my misunderstanding and maybe, uh, maybe Erica can clear this up for me because I was under the impression that from pretty early on in Australopithecus, we have a very much uh, sort of ventrally pointing in terms of the skull frame and magnum, and that because bipedality is such an early trait in hominins, that it did not actually vary within hominin, hominin A, significantly throughout geological time, but maybe I'm just wrong about that. That was just my impression. Am I off? So, no. So the thing is, is that it moves ventrally very, very early on. You're absolutely right. The angle changes a bit. Um, there's an excellent paper that I have on the, the angle of the foramen magnum in the hominins and how we already see, interestingly enough, in Australopithecus afarensis, um, the location is very derived, but the angle is somewhat basal. So you see this movement underneath, but you know, it's almost still like they're hunched over a bit. They're not nearly as efficient a biped as for instance, Homo erectus would be. Um, but that's why I was curious to see if the location of the foramen magnum, um, because I, I, with the pictures you're showing, I don't think you can see the angle. You at least you shouldn't be able to. Maybe maybe you compared it with um with other skulls, like with ventral ventral skulls, to see if you could get the angle and the position. Um, but the there are two variables that determine whether or not like how efficient of a of a um how efficient of a vertebral column with the head on top and the weight bearing directly downward, and that would be again the position and the angle. So by Homo habilis, I believe, if I'm remembering correctly, we see a pretty derived position in both, um, which is why I, I, I think that it's interesting that you could that you can see a match or that you're seeing a match in the clustering of for, for the two groups in the clustering of the foramen magnum and the skull, the brain case. Um, I also think it's interesting that you are seeing two clusterings at all for the brain case because essentially. Um, and it very much depends on how you're splitting up Homo erectus. But, you know, if I can share my screen in a little bit, I've got quite a nice gradient for brain case size going from what we see. Sorry, I just hit my mic. You guys probably heard that. Um, going from your uh, 290, 350-ish range and your very earlier members, like say, Helanthropus chidensis, um, up through the Australopithecines at 490, 500 max. Um, and then through into Homo habilis, which maxes out at about 700. If you include Rudolfensis, I think you can even get into like the 800s there. Homo erectus ranges wildly from 500 all the way up to 950, I want to say, if I'm remembering, again, if I'm remembering correctly. And then you start to get even more derived in the later hominins. Um, but the thing with Homo erectus is you can indeed split it up. And if you do, you can get three distinct clusterings within Homo erectus of brain case range being 500 to 700 for Homo georgicus. Um, and into that, I think 800, 900 for Aragaster and 900 and up for Homo erectus. So it depends on how you cluster them. Um, and if you do that, I would imagine that you would have to narrow that scope of where you where you draw that line and what i have found at least in talking to folks who aren't super keen on human evolution is eventually it will always boil down to a behavior um they'll say okay well maybe you can occupy all of the brain case size all of the, the brain the entire brain case gradient with members of homo erectus and with members of uh habilis and rudolfensis and gautingensis but what about the behaviors and to that, I would say, then you're no longer in the realm of evolution and, and phylogenetics and morphology. You're you're moving into into behaviors which can't be reliably used to cluster species at all. Right. Um, and and so from that perspective, I would say you can have the opinion. Like for instance, um, Fuzrana is of that opinion. He is he has is very much keen on the idea of okay. 
what we've got looks a lot like human evolution. Um, I just don't, I don't think that it is. I'm going, I'm going off of the opinion that it's not. Todd Wood is the same way where he's like, yeah, it looks like human evolution. What are you going to do? Um, but I don't think I'm keen on the idea. And that's fine. Like, I think that that's a okay. As long as there is a recognition, we don't see this very often in the young earth creationist community, but as long as there's a recognition that it is indeed an opinion and not something that's heavily rooted in um, empiricism. I'm a, I'm a little less fine because I feel like it's a lot of special pleading and I'm not a big fan of special pleading, but because uh, it's like hu humans yeah. are special for reasons. And it's like, uh, are they though? Yeah, human human <laughs> exceptionalism is. I I found that if you want human except if you want to see human exceptionalism blown out of the water, reading works by Franz De Waal is an incredible experience. It you it becomes very evident that what we do is is very awesome and cool in a lot of ways, but it's a scaled up version of what other things do. Yeah. And sometimes they scale things up in different directions. But the example I love is that it's like, wow, we can see all the colors of the rainbow. Uh, unless you include mantis shrimp, in which case we can <laughs> one fourth of the colors of the rainbow. <laughs> Although um, I will, I will point out though, uh, while mantis shrimp do have an exceptional number of uh, different types of uh, photoreceptors to receive that peak in different wavelengths, they actually have a lot of overlap between the different photoreceptors. So it's actually not that clear to what degree that turns into something that we would recognize as color vision that is analogous to ours, because they have a lot of these where like. The peak wavelength for one photoreceptor is, you know, a, a, you know, a few like nanometers away from the next one, and that most of the time they're both going to be stimulated about equally by most of the photons hitting them. So, right, it's a it's a weird thing with mantis shrimp. We're not clear on how mantis shrimp are taking this color data that they're getting from their like twenty three different kinds of color receptors, and, yeah, and processing that because they're doing something with it, but it's it's very different from what humans are doing, where we have widely separated um peak values and there's very little overlap between our um our various kinds of color receptors and actually uh, that's one of the reasons why some people are a bit colorblind is because they're um i think it's like their their red and green uh photoreceptive cells are too close to each other in terms of peak wavelength and so they mostly just get stimulated at the same time by the same wavelengths so it makes it hard for them to figure out which color is which yeah, what I'm hearing, Dapper, is that you roasted my analogy, and now I can't use it as much anymore. So uh, thank you. Hey, you know what? Mantis shrimp are cool still. And hey, they, are cool. They can determine the the polarization both linearly and annularly of sunlight. So I like that. Um, okay, very quickly. Um, so I I want to send you this later, King, if I could get your email from. Uh, Actually, I think I have your email already. Um, I, yes. I can give it to you. Even if you no, no, no. I have it. We had okay. a conversation. I remember that now. Um, so I, I have multiple in... different things that I'd love to talk about. But oh, well, I mean, uh, I'm okay oh, no, to no, keep no, going. No no. Uh, no, no, I'm great to keep going. I was, I was just going to say something about uh, the crania and then end that statement with allow me to send you some some papers, or I can share my screen and we can go over them. It's just I know I understand it can be a little tedious. Actually, that. Um, that is a question that I have. Um, so it's, you went through these, you found all these uh, sort of like profile view skulls, right? And you, you, you made a grid, which is cool. I like the grid. But I also wonder, did you check, um, did you do any like a literature survey where you took um, the numbers that were recorded in literature for various uh, skulls and then use that in your data set? Or was it all just, um, and I'm not saying it's bad to, you know, just use your, your own data that you generated, but did you compare it to, say, data sets that you could collect from the literature on human evolution? I decidedly did not. Okay. okay. Um, um, the, reason, the reason I wanted to ask that really fast as well is because, uh, so I've got a, a nice research document for, for primatology in general, and that includes heavy overlap with human evolution. So I include a lot of my human evolution stuff. And for brain case in particular, I've got a, a very nice series of papers that range, you know, obviously from the, the 70s and the 80s when a lot of these organisms were first discovered. That's the nice thing about paleontology, by the way, is that measurements don't change very much. So even if methodology changes, you can still get pretty reliable measurements and, and yeah. compare them. And the papers can still be good. I have to have that conversation with standing in them a lot because they use old literature 
for things like <laughs> genetics, right. which you can't use very reliably I, because technology changes. I had that exact same conversation with uh, with Ben Toven uh, on the most recent uh, Kent with Bent that we did, because you know when he was going into school for his, I'm not supposed to say exactly what he's doing, but it's in the it's in the medical field. His professors right. were like. If the paper is more than five years old, we don't want you to cite it. Just don't. Right. But the thing right. is, and I was like, <laughs> in paleontology, though, you might end up citing a paper from 1890 because that's the paper that described the specimen you're writing about. What and, are you yeah, going to do? And and that's the that's the thing. It it very much depends on the field you're looking at, right? Yeah. I mean, history is the same way. Like if you're involved <laughs> you have in to history, cite old stuff for history. It's, yeah. It's, sorry, you guys can hear this dog of no, one of my three one dogs. Of, I did a um. I did a uh, a class that was just me and a professor. It was it was a class that we basically created ourselves. But that it was but um basically every literally every citation in my like twenty five page paper that was the end result of this class was like handwritten note from this guy to this guy dated you know like eighteen sixty two. You can find it in the Boston Public Library if you physically right. walk in there. Otherwise, good luck. <laughs> Yeah, it will, and and that's that's what a lot of it will end up boiling down to, right? With with a lot of these early descriptions, because items change hands, and sometimes they disappear, and you know you end up with these these uh, issues where you're having to go with secondhand accounts or plaster um, casts of things, and you're like, all right, you know, this is what we got, this is what we got to go off of, um, and you can look at that original methodology and be like, okay, was this good or was this bad? And you can you can absolutely take that into account, but then the measurements are the key stuff, right? That's yeah. that's what you really want to look at. That femur um, is the length it is. Is the length it is? Yeah, exactly. Right, exactly. And and in many, in most cases, I feel comfortable saying you can you can still find the original specimen. The original specimen is located somewhere, <laughs> and wow. you can reach out Rip, to the Rip the Spinosaurus holotype. Oh, I I can't. I know they're they're they're. Um, we have a lot of rest in pieces post World War II for yeah. <laughs> many unfortunately. Way to bomb um, museums, guys, on both sides. I, I know, I know. The good, the, the the thing is, is that many for our hominins, many of them are located in in the country in which they were found, which happens to be a lot in Africa. And I'm like, yes, please, that that is a good location. Most African nations aren't getting in like nuclear scale. Yeah, no, no one's carpet bombing <laughs> Africa. Yeah, exact. Not for now. For now. Well, Talk on wood. So far, um, as far as I know, no, nowhere in Africa has ever been carpet bombed. So good job, Africa. Yeah. Yes, good job, <laughs> Africa. Um, yeah, so, so what I was going to say before we move on very briefly, um, and then I'm going to grab some more coffee as well, is for Australopithecus africanus, I've got 480 to 500 squared centimeters uh, or centimeters squared. Then our paranthropines range from like 4 to 550. Of course, they're not in their cousins of ours. Uh, for Homo habilis, I've got 550 to 690, so approximately 550 to 700. For Rudolfensis, I've got 775 as our general average. For um, Homo erectus, I've got 800 to 900 as our range. But again, that's that's Homo erectus. That's not including Homo georgicus, which, which by the way, I have a lovely uh, little excerpt that I would love to get into very briefly that covers uh, the Desmani specimens in my 2017 edition of Processes in Human Evolution, which is coming to the conclusion that we, at least with the Desmani and indeed a couple of other specimens of what was colloquially referred to as Homo erectus, need to be considered, if anything else, variations within Homo erectus, but they make the argument for Homo georgicus uh, as well as Homo ergaster for certain members, and then they include these lovely parsimony trees uh, that, that place them. So, but what I was going to say was, uh, after Homo erectus, we also have Heidelbergensis, which has 1,000 to 1,220 squared centimeters, and Neanderthalensis exceeds modern humans at 1,500 to 1,700. Um, so, you know, we've that, that's an interesting thing, too, that I'd love to pick your brain about, Kane, is if you're including Homo neanderthalensis with humans, I would... I would actually posit that you're being a bit inconsistent because while Neanderthalensis do have a brain case that is in some cases within the human range, we would actually cluster on average outside of them being on the smaller end because they've got this massive uh, occipital lobe in the back that adds to their 
like literally two, it ranges from where I've got here, 300 to 400 cc's difference. But that's pretty, that's pretty big. I mean, that's the difference, what we see between um, uh, chimpanzees and homo habilis. Like that's, that's a pretty big range difference. So um, yeah. I, I think what I would like to do is um, I'll ask a quick question. I think we should take a quick break because uh, Erica needs some more coffee. Yeah, I, need, I need something with ice in it. And I also need to turn the AC on for a few minutes to cool this room down a little bit. So um, the, the question that I have is, okay, so I think if I can summarize Erica and she can correct me if I'm, I'm doing it poorly. Um, after doing a fairly thorough, because I mean, this is Erica's, I mean, profession basically. After doing in, gen a, in gentle field, let's say. Fair enough, right. So after doing a fairly thorough literature survey, Erica has found something which agrees with the general consensus, which is to say that we actually do not have very strong clustering in hominin fossils when you take the entire suite of what has been discovered into account. And in fact, you can find a specimen with almost any brain case size that you care to name within you know, a margin of error. And I so would, I, would feel, I would feel comfortable saying that. And as a quick note as well for the uh, Demonisi, which I was saying that wrong, Demonisi, it's Demonisi. Um, I screwed that up and probably set the precedent in this group for pronouncing that wrong. Again, I focus on early. Bad given, <laughs> bad. I know, I'm <laughs> horrible. Um, but so the latest consensus uh, textbook wise for that appears to be that the Demonisi specimens are Homo georgicus. Uh, and they cluster, interestingly enough, within both the human and the Australopithecine range um, because they see a, or I guess it would depend on how you clustered them as an individual, but they have brain case size as low as like 550 and as high as 775. So they are attributing that to a potential for sexual dimorphism, which would not be surprising at all. Uh, as that is what we see as a trend within the Australopithecines is some pretty heavy size dimorphism uh, within the males and females. Now, you can't say that definitively. Obviously, we don't know for sure if, if we are indeed dealing with males and females, but it does seem parsimonious with the data set that we have. Um, so yes, Dapper is correct in saying that pick, pick a brain case size, you can probably find a hominin that occupies it. Um, and interestingly enough, very often when you pick that brain case size, you will find more basal traits in the rest of the crania um, if you're not dealing with an anatomically modern human. And I would argue, I would make the argument that depending on how you're trying to cluster two groups, you will get different results every time you pick a trait for which two groups you end up with. That's, that's, that would be my prediction. So Kane, before we took that break, which we are now back from, uh, you said that you had a really quick question that you wanted to ask, but I think uh, Erica had already gotten up and left us all I by our lonesome. Yeah. So what was that, that quick question that you wanted to ask? So you're... <laughs> this kind of feels out of context, but... <laughs> no, no, please. Open but, conversation. Uh, the, uh, the measurements that is often used is in um, CCs, right? Yes. Okay, so and that that measurement is usually used to if it falls within this range, it's to this or it's probably closer to that, right? No, that um. So what they do is they they'll measure the full brain case volume, right? And then they'll say, all right, this is what we have for the brain case volume. Um, that alone may cluster within this species or this species based off of what we know. Uh, but at the same time, the postcranium may create problems. And if the postcrania matches, like, they will basically take the entire hypodyme of the species, right? So let's say I go out... Uh, I think hypodyme might need a definition. Yeah, so the, the suite of characteristics that um, define a species. This is the unique set, full-on set of characteristics. If that doesn't match anything that we already have then it typically gets a brand new species. Or, depending on how extreme it is, it might be a regional variant. Um, and if you're thinking, boy, that sure sounds like it's kind of arbitrary, that's because it is. <laughs> um, yep, species so, are, are human conventions. They're not a real thing in the real world. 
Right, which is right. why when you get things that are really close together, it gets very blurry on what is a, a variant and what is a new species. So if I go out to South Africa and I start chiseling around and I come up with a brand new skull and a, and a maybe 40% of the postcrania, and I say, okay, I'm trying to figure out who all this belongs to. You know, I'm in South Africa, so it could be Australopithecus africanus. Uh, it could be um, Australopithecus sediba. It could be Homo naledi. It could be certain variants of Homo erectus or Heidelbergensis or whatever. But I've, I've, I've got this. I don't know anything about it. Um, and now I'm like, let's figure out which one it clusters into. So I would go and I would take measurements of all the characteristics. So let's say that this, for instance, is the skull that I find. I take the cranial um, volume, the, the brain case volume. I might measure the angle of the zygomatics. I might measure the angle of the prognathism. I might count the cusping on all of the teeth. I might see if there's a retromolar gap. I measure, measure the length uh, or the breadth rather of the ramus and the length as well, the body of the mandible, um, whatever. All you, you get what I'm saying. I would just take as many measurements as possible from the skull as well as from the postcrania. And I would put all of those into a statistical software, statistics software like R, for instance. And I would cross check it with what we have for everything else. Um, now, depending on what kind of test you run, it's going to, it, perhaps you might get it where it's like, okay, well, with regard to the dentition, it's closest to, I don't know, uh, homo habilis, but with regard to the cranial, the, the, um, uh, brain case, it's closest to homo erectus. And with regard to the measurements of the mandible, it's closest to Australopithecus africanus. And the postcranium most closely also matches uh, homo habilis. So with all of that, I would say, okay, it kind of looks like we've got a, a new species on our hands. And then I would run an additional test in all likelihood where I'm like, okay, does this fall within a margin of any of the variants of what we have? Or is it even close? And if it is, then I might be like, okay, well, it looks like this is just a very specialized version of Homo habilis. Um, maybe because it was under certain environmental pressures, it responded in such a way as to grow more basal in some ways and more derived in others. Um, and the way that I would do that is maybe I would look at the conditions, the, the paleo environment that this organism lived in by taking like geochemical samples from the rock, whatever. Um, but I might also find that it doesn't fall within that range. And it truly is all by itself. So then I'm thinking to myself, okay, this kind of looks like it's a brand new species. Its hypodyme is unique. Um, and while some traits match other organisms, the entire suite is unique. That's how I would decide if it's a brand new species. So that's the long way of saying, no, it's not just the cranium, the, the, um, I make this mistake every time. It's not just the brain case size that we would use to decide where it falls. The brain case size is merely one piece in equal consideration with all of the other characteristics that typically go into a hypodyne for a hominin. So, yeah, I, I, I am interested to see what your analysis is because, um, I mean, I'm certainly not qualified to make that analysis, but Erica may well be. Um, I have to take the word of uh, paleoanthropologists because what the heck do I know about humans? Uh, I know, you're just a dinosaur. Exactly. And uh, I know about dinosaurs. That's why I was willing to criticize, say, the identification of a, what's almost certainly a bison horn as a triceratops horn. Oh, I know. I oh my god, I cannot. Yeah. Uh, it was amazing that, that uh, the entirety of the section on that paper that identified as a triceratops was just like, it's a triceratops. Oh, okay, I guess just because you said so. Yeah, you're like, on the basis of what exactly? <laughs> <laughs> uh... Oh, no, any chance that you get to include us dunking on, on Mark Armitage, please include. Oh, goodness. <laughs> Yeah, please do, because I, I, any opportunity I get to be like Mark Armitage has bad methodology, um, I want <laughs> to express that. Bad seems to barely cover it. It's absolutely abysmal. It's it barely even counts as methodology. No, it's and that's because he's a microscop microscopist. Something like that. Yeah, he's not a field paleontologist. Yeah, he yeah he's not a real paleontologist. Yeah. And, and and neither am I. But I would not insist that my um. 
I would not insist that my methodology was on par with paleontology if I wasn't a paleontologist. Right. Do you remember he didn't even have in situ photos of the vertebrae he claims to have found? Oh my god. And he yeah, he just yanked them out of the ground. Yep. And his one in situ photograph of the uh, the horn is so poorly lit you can't even tell the actual length of the horn. Oh, Erica, I forgot. He Armitage also didn't take in situ photos of the rib. Yeah, why would we expect him to take in situ photos of the rib though? Ugh. Because he he already showed that he was not willing to do it with um with literally anything else other than that one horn. And even then, you have to up the contrast to see the full length because someone is standing in the way. Yup. Hey, let me block your shot so it's useless. Like, you know, I, oh my God. I, my, um. It's, it's the worst paleontology paper I've ever encountered. Man. Hey, you know what? Well, at least Mark Armitage didn't put someone else's watermark on his paper. At least Mark <laughs> Armitage didn't claim to be uh, a published author when, to our knowledge, he does not have um, a, a bachelor's degree. Yeah. But hey, um, he's not, Mark Armitage is not certified in every single kind of herbalism ever anywhere. Nor, yeah, nor is he a brain force, like, pill seller or whatever the heck, like, yeah. raw matter selling the, the testosto manly pills. <laughs> Sure, sure to increase your male virility. I'm going to get some more coffee because that makes me nauseous to think about. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for watching, but before you go, I'd like to take a minute to say thank you to my patrons and channel members on YouTube. They help me make this channel possible, and without them, I couldn't keep going. Specifically, I want to thank my $20 and above patrons, Ben Tovind, Ian Chen, Sphincter of Doom, Chris Love, Henry Hutanen, and Bob Knob. If you'd like to join the channel or become a patron, Links are in the description, and if that's not right for you, but you want some other way to help out, there's also an Amazon wish list, as well as a Teespring store where you can get Dapper Dino merchandise. If none of that works for you, just liking and sharing this video really helps out. I'm the Dapper Dinosaur. Well,